Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Stribe's second webinar, Supporting Culture and Employee Wellbeing During Uncertain Times. I've been informed that there's been over 100 signups to this webinar with a real range of leaders joining us from small startups to large global multi-generational organizations. Um, as you can see from my glorious background, we've all moved back to home working. And for me, this webinar couldn't have been timed any better as we prepare ourselves for lockdown 2.0. It's almost as if my wonderful marketing team knew this would happen and timed the second Stribe webinar seriously, series perfectly <laughs> today, just before we move in. Um, for those of you that I've not had the, the pleasure of, of speaking to, um, my name is Michael Brennan, and I am the co-founder and CEO of the wonderful organization, which is Strive and Toot Toot. Um, a quick introduction. A number of years ago, we developed the world's first reporting app for children and young people in schools. And to date, we've helped over 600,000 children globally report 70,000 well-being concerns. As a result of our success in education two years ago, we approached uh, and we were approached by um, the global head of wellbeing for Barclays Bank and the HRD and leadership team of Wigan Council. And they asked us to support them in developing a solution to help these organizations to better understand their employees and teams needs in a more real time way than that of annual surveys. Um, and the key point about this is that we all know that healthy and engaged employees together with a strong workplace culture is the secret source to organizations and business success. It's about looking after your people, understanding what's important to them and driving that forwards through data and change. If you'd like to learn more about Strive, then please visit our website at www.strivehq.com. Um, but enough about myself and my organization. Today, I have the pleasure of interviewing the wonderful Samoya Rahimi, wellbeing manager of Cancer Research, wonderful smile, and I'll introduce you in just a moment. Um, for everybody that's on the webinar, uh, first and foremost, we want this to be led by you, our audience. This is a really unique opportunity to ask well-being and cultural related questions to the expert of Samaya. Anything that you want to ask, you will see on the bottom of your Zoom tab, just along the bottom, there's a Q&A box. Um, I'm hoping, please, that you could fill this with as many questions as possible so that I can literally run down them and ask Samaya the question, let her do all the talking today. Um, I do have some preset questions to get us warmed up going through, but like I say, please do submit your questions uh, all the way through and we'll answer them as best we can. There's a wonderful little feature called Upvote. If you see when a question is submitted, if you click on that Upvote, it will take it to the top of my list and it will make me answer that, uh, sorry, ask that question first of all to Samoya. So if you see a question you thought you wanted to ask but haven't written that down yet, please do pop that up and we'll go from there. We're aiming to be wrapped up uh, within the hour. So by 1 p.m. you'll be able to go for a coffee and a quick pee before your next Zoom meeting one after the other for the afternoon. But sit back, relax, and, and please take part in the next hour. Um, I do want to warn you that as a male, I can confirm that I can't multitask. Uh, so I'm going to do my best to interview, ask the questions and see how we get on. Uh, Samoya said she was nervous. Uh, I think I'm more <laughs> nervous than what she is. So together, we're going to stumble through this absolutely brilliantly, hopefully with key focuses of bringing out real life solutions from an expert talking about day to day supporting culture and well-being within a, a wonderful organization that's cancer research. Culture well-being, two very big words, uh, important topics and priorities that we are focusing on today. And I'm delighted to be joined by Samoya, well-being manager of Cancer Research to talk about such an important topic. I first met Samoya 12 months ago, and I'll never forget our first meeting together in head office when we were allowed to meet. Um, and for me, the stars completely aligned. You, you meet people and you, you enjoy that experience, but we both had one very strong shared mission, which was to support employees and their well-being in, in a modern world. And I was fascinated by Samaya's passion, drive and determination to ensure that cancer research delivers a world leading service and support function for its people. Um, so Samaya, without further ado, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us and great to have you. How are you? I'm very well nervous, as I mentioned before, but thank you so much for that warm welcome. Um, just to kick things off, I'll tell you a little bit about myself, if that's okay. So I joined Cancer Research UK a year and a half ago. 
And I joined at a time where Cancer Research UK was going through quite a big change anyway. Um, we were moving from our angel office to the newly built Stratford office in IQL. Um, funnily enough, I actually previously worked for the company that actually built the building we were moving into. So it was actually quite easy for me. I understood the area we were moving into and I knew that there was a lot of well-being um, well-being initiatives that we could do for Cancer Research UK. When I did first join um, CI UK, there wasn't much of a well-being um, strategy or aspect to the organisation, but there was so much passion and want for it all. Um, and I was completely overwhelmed by the amount of support I received from day one when I was coming up with all of my ideas and how we were going to push well-being forward. Um, I've been doing health and well-being for about seven years. I previously worked for a construction company. So it was very, very different going from construction to charity. I've learned a lot. I've definitely learned a lot. And I think I've become a better person from learning so much and not spending so much money. But we'll get to that later on. So yeah, that's a little bit about how I joined Cancer Research. Brilliant. Thank you so much indeed for that introduction um everybody please do submit as many questions as you like i've got a few questions to start the conversation off now but it'd be great to get your views your questions as we go through this but as samoya shares some of her experiences and real life examples um please do drive forward those questions samoya could you start by talking us through some of the changes that you made at cancer research uk that have helped to create a culture of well-being particularly during this time? Yeah, so as, as I mentioned before, um, I was in quite a unique position when I joined Cancer Research UK because they didn't really have a strategy. They didn't have a wellbeing plan as such. So I was able to create one and put loads of different things, um, mechanisms into place to support our employees. And literally a week before we went into our first lockdown, I had just finished creating an online portal to house all of our health and well-being support. So everything from signposting to external, to signposting internal, to any of the training that I was doing or any training anyone else from learning development were creating, we were able to put all of that onto one shared portal everybody would have access to. Um, that was probably the biggest change um, that occurred at Cancer Research and it was definitely an, an absolute godsend because as soon as we went into lockdown that was the only way we were able to keep up with all of our well-being initiatives, well-being programs, supporting all of our staff. I mean just a little bit of a background as to what kind of numbers we're talking. We have 4,000 members of staff in total paid um, staff members. We have 600 shops located England, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland. Um, we have roughly, this is pre-pandemic, 40,000 volunteers. So although we don't directly look after the well-being of our volunteers, we are still able to use our online portals and our EAP system, our occupational health, all of our mental health training and anything we're doing to support our volunteers as well. So that was probably one of the biggest changes that we had to make. Bringing in a strategy, I think from the very beginning was very, very helpful because as I mentioned, there was such a want and a need for well-being at Cancer Research. And as soon as we brought... Um, the strategy in it kind of pulled everything together and it gave it gave cancer research uk a unified sort of um uh what's the word a unified platform a unified um voice for well-being that everyone could get access to we have so many different directorates our trading um of the arm of the organization have historically been a little bit sort of away from the rest of the organization and one of the challenges was to kind of bring them in with us bring them back in to you know so we can all be one unified cancer research uk 
And that goes back to what you were saying about culture. So that's one of the things that we're pushing towards. It's work in progress. We're not completely there yet. But I think it's this pandemic definitely showed that having a unified voice, a unified support system, um, an online portal where everyone can access is definitely an absolute must. And that was one of the biggest things that we have seen has helped and support our employees throughout. Fantastic. And we've already got a couple of questions coming through some here, which relate um, very nicely. And I'll try and kind of transition these through. So um, Elizabeth Lerpenier is, is asking around, how did you start to well, build a wellbeing strategy? So if we think about that lovely flow, that there was such a need for wellbeing. And then here we are with that kind of, portal and support and understanding of your whole organization as one cancer research uk how do you start what's that bit when you sit down with your your book your paper your whiteboard talk us through that journey um to be honest with you as i mentioned because i'd never worked for a charity before it was a bit of a culture shock for me when i first went in because i didn't realize that there were so many different directorates or business units as it were so the first thing i think you need to do is understand what the needs are of all the different directorates, all the different business units, all the different working arms of your organization. And from that, you can then create or pinpoint, and it, it usually jumps out at you when you find one unified kind of need for something. So for example, our trading, you know, the people in the shops, they had a completely different need to those working in the labs for example, or those working in the offices. So to be able to get them all to sit them all down together and say, right, what does good look like to you? What, what does a good well-being plan look like to you? I did spend a lot of time going around the shops and warehouses just to understand what that it is that we need to do. And once I kind of had all of that, I thought, right, let's keep it simple. My, my motto is always keep it simple. Do one, two, or you know, three things maximum really, really well, um, and then bring in other things. So I thought, let's, from, from the strategy, let's have three pillars. So we have the mental well-being pillar, we have the physical well-being pillar, and we have the working environment. And everything we do in terms of well-being will slot into these three pillars. Um, and these three pillars came out from sitting and talking to all the different directorates, talking to the heads, the directors, understanding what our CEO wants from a well-being strategy. What, what does, you know, Michelle Mitchell, what does she want from us? Um, it's a difficult one when you've never had a well-being strategy before to create one from scratch. But I think if you go in with some form of understanding of well-being, what well-being should kind of look like. And I'm not saying there is an absolute definite, this is what it looks like. Every organization is different. Every person has different needs. So I think you really need to understand your employees. So doing things like, um, you know, staff surveys, um, having, you know, open sessions, you know, let people come to you, talking to you, going out, visiting shops, diff, you know, if, if you work in a charity, going and visiting all the different labs and things like that. So talking to as many different people as you can to get a real understanding of what your organization actually needs in terms of well-being. And the strategy kind of almost builds itself from that. It's almost like a jigsaw. Um, everything starts to fit in together. And by the end of it, you think, okay, this, this sounds good, let's do it this way. And as I said, having those three pillars will basically keep you on a straight road instead of having loads of different people trying to do loads of different wellbeing things, but no one's really talking to each other. Um, and not many people are um, what I like to call touch points. You're not really you know, reaching out to as many employees as you could. I hope that answered your question, Elizabeth. <laughs> I think that's a great answer. And I think just building on that, some way of, as I'm thinking through some of the, the wonderful partners that we've worked with, including sort of Barclays and Wigan, there's, there's absolutely two sides of that spectrum, isn't there? There is the element of understanding your people's needs and how you do that in a real time way, um, whether that is 
collecting face to face when we were able to one to one feedback or employee forums, whether that was that that survey element or whether that was just asking the audience in its broader context. And then there's this conversation around what are our pillars and what are our key kind of objectives that everybody can understand. And you kind of need to have both in terms of scoped out, but ultimately what we found to be really, really successful is when you understand your employees' needs and kind of can put them into your pillars, that's when you know that your pillars actually work. It's when you might have four or five pillars that suddenly come out, it's how do you keep it into three? And those names of those pillars are actually really, really important in that strategy to build yeah. out. I mean, with with the working environment, I mean, it. I've just noticed, um, Sophie, your question for um, having a mix of office base and factory staff, that's exactly what Council Research UK is like, like. So we have the warehouses, as I mentioned, the shops, the labs, um, things like that. So it, the working environment is basically for all of those things. So the shop working environment, we're, we're trying to create something called the minimum standard of well-being for shops. I'm lucky that I sit within health and safety. So I have my health and safety colleagues to do the minimum standard for health and safety. And I said, well, why don't we have something for well-being? You know, something simple as do our staff have somewhere to sit on their lunch breaks? A lot of our shops don't. So that was something that came out of going around talking to everybody. And yes, a lot of our shops, I feel a lot like the um, factory staff that you've mentioned in your question, don't have access to a computer. They, they, they can't just come off the shop floor and you know go onto our work laptop whenever they feel like it. So how do we access that? We, they can access our SharePoint pages, our Yammer pages, anything like that they can access via their phones. But also it's about training the shop managers. So if you have the right training in place for your people managers, then that will filter down to all the frontline staff, so the factory staff, the shop workers, and our volunteers. I think it's really, really good and, 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 and interesting. And just building on, there's a question that's been voted up at the top, um, relating back to your 4,000 staff and 600 shops. How do you, how did you, how are you, how are you going to gather real-time information on employee well-being extremely quickly during and ongoing through the pandemic? I'm going to be really honest. That's a difficult one to answer because I'm still trying to work that out. It's, I mean, when the pandemic, before the pandemic hit, I thought I had a great thing in place where I was in contact with all the area managers for our shops. I was in contact. I had one contact at every lab. And I thought this is great because I can just pull everyone together um, and you know pull out surveys and things like that. But now that the pandemic's here, a lot of people have been furloughed. So all our shop staff are, are furloughed and you're not supposed to work when you're furloughed. So is it fair for me to be contacting them and asking them questions about their well-being? Um, so once we did come back and all the shops opened and everyone was off furlough again after the first lockdown, we did a very quick pulse survey just to find out how people were feeling, um, if there was any areas that we really needed to address ASAP, are we missing anything? That's always a concern of mine, to be honest. Am I missing something? Um, so to answer your question, that's a difficult one. Unfortunately, I wish I had a great answer, but if prior to the pandemic we had a system in place that we were able to ask questions quite quickly. You know, if people could get those questions on their phones via an app or something like that, that would have been a breeze. It would have been really easy to gather our information. But unfortunately, we don't have anything like that at CR UK, but we are always in touch with our employees, whether they're on furlough or not. And I think so far, I haven't had any bad feedback to say that anything major had been missed. So yeah, we're trying our best. And like everyone else, we're working through trying to trying to work out the best way possible to try and stay in touch with our employees at all times. Brilliant, thank you. And I think from, from our point of view as, as experts in, in, in that field, it is a difficult process, particularly when you've got large multi-generational multi-locational areas and then when you have a fact where you may not have a volunteer or an employee with a dedicated 
email address for those pulses. It, it, it's about bridging that gap and the digital transformation piece around being able to give an employee a phone app, a something that can connect you. But that's also, I know we've talked about this a lot over the last year, it's, it's, a, it's a large change and things have to happen quite quickly because the pandemic's making that quite quickly. But I think it's quite easy to get that wrong too. I think you can end up putting too many features and systems in place. Have you had yeah. an experience of overloading <laughs> with and systems? Also, one one thing that uh, we have to realise is we have such a, at Cancer Research UK, we have such a diff- large demographic of people from different backgrounds, ages, and not everyone has a smartphone where you can send these things to. So how do we deal with that? And then again, it goes back to making sure that our area managers and our shop managers, our assistant managers are all trained up. So we're currently going through this whole um, training, learning and development um period where we're training all of our shop managers and our assistant managers with mental health not first aid but mental health awareness so that they at least they have something as a tool that they can use for themselves at home you know because unfortunately now all of England are being furloughed so that they can take that away with them as well so definitely I think educating our managers to be able to support their team is, is the best way. And also keeping the routes of communication open at all times and having a safe space. So I always say, if you can't speak to your manager, if you don't feel comfortable doing that, find someone that you do feel comfortable talking to. Um, a lot of what I do is very heavily based on mental health. And I think especially at this time, that is one of the most important things that we need to make sure that we are supporting our employees. So keep, keep an open, open route um, channel of communication at all times and I think actually going back Mike to what you asked me about changes that have happened through CI UK I think not so much a physical change but more of an attitude change that I've seen is that before the lockdown before pandemic there wasn't much there was a lot of support for mental health first aiders we have 50 of them but there was a lot of people who very openly said to me that Either they they didn't believe in having a mental health first aid network. They didn't believe that it was working. Um, And also a lot of managers were having problems with allowing their staff to work from home. You know, you have to be seen to be doing work. So I think one of the, I don't know if if we can say something good has come out of this pandemic, but one of the positive things that I, I can see coming out of this pandemic is that People now aren't afraid to allow their teams to work from home because they've realized that actually, unless you're you know, a scientist in one of our labs, which unfortunately you won't be able to work from home, everything else can be done from home. Um, and there's a, a lot more relaxed, the environment feels a lot more relaxed when it comes to that, that kind of attitude. People are learning a new way of working. I've, you know, I get people coming to me saying things like, I feel like I need to be visible all the time on my laptop. And I've said, block out times for your focus times. And that is your time to focus on whatever you need to do. And whoever looks at your calendar can see that you're you're working, you're focusing, and you don't feel like you should be, you know, actively with a red, uh, with the green light on your, you know, um, on your teams to show that that you are there. And a lot of the managers have started to do this and that's cascaded down to the teams. So I think, yeah, uh, attitude change is definitely one of the positives that has come out of this pandemic. I think that's a really important point. And I learned this as a, or I'm learning uh, on the fly as a young uh, CEO and leader of, of a wonderful team of 10 and trust is is a big thing Absolutely. that had to come from this. and a mindset change in, like you say, the the inputs to the outputs. The only thing that we can measure at home is the output. So trust has to have the the during between being in the communication and the the output around that. That's all we can ask of achieving however we get there. (laughs) Exactly. And I mean, it's, it's amazing how everyone has pulled together. It's, you know, there's no... There's no one team has, that's turned around and said, you know, we're not pulling our weight or they're not pulling their weight. Everybody has got behind absolutely everything. You know, 
I've suddenly in the past week since the second lockdown has been um, announced, my diary is completely full with people wanting mental health awareness sessions for their teams, wanting, so it goes back to those, you know, me going back to those people who didn't believe in having a mental health, yeah. you know, network. I'm not, I'm not sitting there going, I told you so, but it's a bit of a, you know, this is a good way of showing why we need mental health first aiders, why we need a well-being plan, why we need a strategy, why it's really, really, really important that you listen to your employees and what they need and try and offer it as best as you can. I mean, as a charity, unfortunately, as I mentioned um, at the beginning, I've learned very quickly how to do a lot of my well-being initiatives without spending a penny, which is absolutely amazing because I'm not very good with um, <laughs> I'm not very good with monies, but it's great because I've realized actually, you know, organizations have so much within them already that they can use and they can signpost people to. You wouldn't believe how many people start at an organization, get told about their um, employee assistant program, you know, six months down the line, they've actually forgotten about it. So, and those employee assistant programs are absolutely amazing because some of them have got some, you know, they've got counseling, they've got meditation, they have mindfulness, they have everything. And you don't have to spend anything extra to tap into them. No, absolutely. Um, and I think as we're listening to kind of your honest approach in terms of you know doing things and making it up as it goes in a structured and strategic yeah. way to a certain extent it's, it's it's important to remind all of us that we're all human and, and and you have to try things i think if i could ask kind of two probing questions if i may and they relate to each other it's we're hearing lots of wonderful little snippets of mental health first aiders yeah. and the things you're doing and your portals and everything um There'll be a lot of organizations on here that are similar to you in terms of dispersed and varied and demographics in terms of that workforce and spread across the piece. Um, what's been the one consistent thing that's worked really well for you all the way through? And then also, can you share something that has completely failed that you thought would have been the answer, if, if you may? <laughs> that's a difficult one. I think definitely my mental health first stage network. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I can't take the credit for setting that up because that was already set up before I started. But I personally, myself, have been a mental health first aider for seven years now. And when I first was trained, as I mentioned, I was working in a construction company and there wasn't any such network. No one really knew much about it. So when I did get trained up, I thought, this is amazing. And that's kind of where my, my personal well-being journey started. And I thought, this is absolutely amazing. Why are more companies not doing this? So when I came to Council Research UK, I didn't really have to work very hard because there was already one set up. Mm. What they didn't have um, was any form of sort of structure to it. Um, they needed a lead, which, which I am now, and they needed sort of more advertising. A lot of people won't feel comfortable going to their colleague um, to talk about their mental health. But what they can do is they can contact someone who's in a completely different part of England, either via phone or via chat, however they want to talk to them. And during the pandemic, what I actually did was I got all my mental health first aiders, all 52 of them, and said, what can we do to support our employees at this time? Because not everyone wants to go to an EAP. Not everyone wants to go to counseling. People just want to use someone as a sounding board, especially someone who knows where you're coming from. That's really, really important. So um, we set up live chats. So we had two mental health first aiders on for like two, three hours a day, and you could literally go on to Teams chat and, you know, contact them. It was all um, private. No one, no one could see each other's chat or anything. And that has been the one consistent thing that has worked throughout having that, because from that, I've been able to push out the manager's mental health awareness sessions. We've been able to create stress management um, 
stress management and well-being training sessions. So it's really, really important. The one thing that I would say about the mental health first aid network is that they do need a lot of support themselves. It's quite a difficult job to listen to someone talking when you're not a health professional. You've just been trained on a two day course to be able to actively listen to someone who's telling you their problems. So you definitely need to have that support mechanism in place um, if you do have that. What didn't work? This is a difficult ones. I, there was a lot of, I, I had a lot of ideas that I wanted to do before we went into lockdown um, the first time. And one of them was my wellbeing champions, a lot like the mental health first aid as wellbeing champions would literally be dotted around all the different um, directorates and they'd be my eyes and ears on the ground to just let me know what's going on. What are people needing? What are we missing? Is what we're doing, is it working? Is it not working? Um, I didn't quite manage to get that off the ground, unfortunately. And I think if I had done that, if we had put that in place before, I would have been able to have a wider reach um, as the previous question was, you know, how do you reach so many people? Um, so yeah, I think, I think that's one of the things that I regret not having done but going for, I'm, I'm, I've picked that back up. So hopefully, fingers crossed, we will have some form of um, wellbeing champions network in place as well. Fantastic. So just listening to all these points, it's, it's a real blend, isn't it? It's, we cannot forget the importance of the human. And even though we're in lockdown, having that ability to speak to someone from kind of the bottom up to top, but equally having people in a structure from top down that support yeah. that. So people trust the process, the structure's there, but then you've got an element of technology around that that can naturally support and, and fill the gaps between whether that's the surveying element, whether that's a portal, it's that ability just to kind of have that second line of support um, that, that's available to, to ultimately bring in either a validation of support or give you some data to see what's working and what's not. And I'm, I've got a couple of wonderful questions that have come in since we've been speaking. So I'm going to start with the top and this transitions nicely. So what are the senior management team or board interested in, in terms of summary statistics or KPIs on mental health awareness, employee wellbeing, employee NPS, which is net promoter score. So that, that leads following what I was saying about having that ability to understand what's happening and not just trust. Yeah. So yeah, that's, that's a really interesting one. Senior management, whenever I go to any of the meetings, it's always, you know, what are the stats? You know, can you show us how many people are using the mental health first aid network? Can you, I always say it's really difficult to put a value on well-being, first of all. And second of all, it's really difficult to report on it. So from experience, I think the best way to understand, you know, return on investment with well-being, and you know, try and gather statistics and data is to go through our sickness absence. And I think if you have the sickness absence down really, really well, so you have, you know, if you have mental health as a um, reason for sickness, don't just have mental health. You need to drop down underneath that to understand what kind of mental health it is. You know, is it depression? Is it anxiety? If it's stress, is it stress due to work? Is it stress due to home life? Um, and so forth. And I think with the, as, as you said, Mike, you really need a good kind of platform, reporting platform in place to be able to do that. And for us, we use a lot of our surveys um, and we, we, you know, we analyze all these surveys and, you know, people always come back to us and say, you know, I used a mental health first aider and yeah, it didn't affect my work, but actually I'm a lot happier that I did and I'm glad I did. Or I went along and used an occupational health therapist. And that's the other data that we gain as um, we can get as well is from our external. So from the EAP and from occupational health um that's that's pretty much what senior management want is to understand how much usage are we getting from our EAP how much usage are we getting from occupational health 
you know, how much usage are we getting from our um, mental health first aiders? So it's all about statistics. And it is really, really difficult to put numbers against all of this. I think in the long run, if your sickness absence is reduced because you've brought in mental health first aiders and, you know, great EAP program and a really good platform to allow people, allow employees to speak out, then, you know, in the long run, you can see your sickness absence reducing. Um, at the moment at Cancer Research UK, I haven't been there long enough to be able to do that comparison, but I'm hoping that that's something we would definitely, we're definitely looking into doing. And I've just noticed, sorry, Mike. No, no. Off there. I noticed the question underneath, how do you create a culture of well-being and how do you get senior leadership buy-in? So again, it's about giving people real life experiences as to why well-being is needed. And I think you have to talk to the audience um, in the way that they would understand. So, you know, for example, if I was talking to the CEO or, you know, CFO, I'd say I was reading somewhere where apparently if you every for every pound that you spend on employee well-being and mental health, you will gain five pounds in productivity back, you know, is that reasonable? Is that what you want to see? Or do you want to see a happy workforce coming into the offices, going into the shops every single day? and really wanting to be there. And the thing, the thing is, anyone who works for Cancer Research UK, you know, they want to be there for a reason. We're all there for one main purpose, and that is to find a cure for cancer. You know, that's, that's why we're there. Um, so we have that unified sort of, you know, one CR UK. And I think a lot of a lot of senior leaders take a little bit of pushing, but no one has ever turned around and said, well, being's not worth it. I don't think in you know my career, I've ever heard anyone say that because everybody understands that a happy workforce is a productive workforce. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, I was reading that report quite recently um, about the, the, the one pound investor gives a five pound return. And it was written, well, there is a report written by Deloitte that was yeah, really, really that. powerful if anybody wants to sort of look at that. And I'm sure our team can share that as part of our follow-up as well, because it was um, a powerful moment that it's back to kind of the outcomes, like you just said there, yeah. what you said, it's about is your organization, whether it's charitable, whether it's a private sector organization, what are you looking to achieve? Is that a revenue number? Is that a fundraising number? Is that a cure number? Is that an impact number? Um, and from there, it's about making sure that your team are aligned with your common mission and values and align up to that to create that culture. Yeah. And then it's enforcing that one pillar around well-being becomes that support framework that everyone Absolutely. works with. Yeah. And I think it's, you know, building a culture of well-being isn't something that's going to be done overnight. I think, again, another positive that's come out of this well-being, as I mentioned um, at, from this pandemic, as I mentioned before, is that it has given people a bit of a push. Mm -hmm. So it's given that cultural aspect a bit of a push. And I think embedding well-being into it's a bit of a cheesy thing to say into the DNA of the organization is really, really important. So how would you go about doing that? So at Cancer Research UK, we've, we've created policies. So we have a stress management policy. That's all about wellbeing. We have, um, so throughout the pandemic, we, we developed a best endeavors guidance. It's not so much a policy, it's more of a guidance for parents and carers. Um, to help them feel a little bit more comfortable knowing that we don't expect you to be working the full um, hours just because you're home, because we understand that you have children and we understand that, you know, you're a carer and we're all in this together. We all get it. We're all, you know, feeling the same way about it. So creating policies, as I mentioned before, lots of training, um, you know, using internal, external resources and making sure people know that they're there yeah. and making them simple. You don't you don't need to make things, especially with the policies, you don't need to make them too difficult. Um, and as I mentioned, for our shops, especially having minimum standards, there's not much that we can do with well-being with the shops. So we look at things like lighting and, you know, 
try in getting pushing a bit of a sustainability factor to it all which is great because then you're you know you're killing two birds with one stone um you know making sure that in the winter there's adequate heating and making sure that in the summer there's adequate ventilation so yeah it's that's that's how you end up you know creating a culture is by slowly slowly embedding it into the dna so just just to build on that because i've been having lots of wonderful conversations with people in this industry yourself or hr leaders or chief of people and it's a really common theme that i'm hearing at the minute that if we think about inclusion diversity equality well-being these words can suddenly become boxed before you even understand your employees needs and i think one thing that we've all become aligned in our conversations is that well-being can provide that kind of umbrella that pillar yeah that helps to reduce bullying, harassment, sickness, absence, that encourages inclusion because people feel well and come together. It supports diversity because you've got different groups. I know we talked about this a lot. It goes back to the very start of building your wellbeing strategy about, you just want to understand what your people exactly. want. And yeah. then at the back end under one umbrella. Exactly, absolutely, no, that's, that's exactly it. And I think, Having a well-being, as I mentioned, cancer research didn't actually have a designated well-being manager before. And I think I'm not saying everyone should go out and recruit one, um, but if they can, do so. Uh, <laughs> because people who do health and well-being and mental health are truly, truly passionate about what they do. And it shows. And every single person that I've spoken to, every single well-being manager that I've spoken to has a personal reason for doing it. And I think that that helps a lot to push for a change in culture to, and when you've had that lived experience of mental health um, or of poor well-being, then it's easier for you to create a really good well-being culture within the organization. It's really difficult to have empathy for something when you've never been through it. Um, and I know many people who've who've had wonderful what they they have great mental health they've never had any problems at all they don't feel you know depressed ever and it's when you talk to them you can tell they're not as invested in the well-being aspect as those who have had a bit of a lived experience yeah i think it's important you, you find a balance of making sure that those that can cope with that structure and yeah. pressure and the mental yeah. health uh, first aiders or well-being champions but equally th there's a level of support that can be sustained because uh, we all know that there's lots of conversations that need to happen that sometimes don't and when they do it's particularly important that, that person gets that support if they feel finally confident to speak up via anonymously of teams or via a platform like yeah. ours or yeah. and you know going back to um one of the questions earlier you know you definitely need senior management buy-in and i was overjoyed when our ceo michelle mitchell said that she would she wants to do a mental health awareness session so she can understand more that's great because that shows that you know it, it shows others um you know within her direct report that it's okay you know to have a mental illness it's okay to talk about it it's okay to want to have a day off so actually talking about days off one of the great initiatives that we've managed to bring in um just after the lockdown are well-being days and i know that many many organizations already do this and i think it's fantastic you know it's an opportunity for our staff um to take that day off and do nothing you know i i set out um news posts to tell people to remind them that your well-being day is not for you to sit on your laptop and check work emails just completely sign off and when i see my manager doing it and when i see the directors doing it and they're you know they send emails around going i'm off that makes me feel better about taking my day for me to spend with my children or to do you know something for myself so i think it's allowing people it's telling people that it's okay to need a day off, especially now. We can't keep putting so much pressure on ourselves um, to get all the work done, even though we might just we might seem so much busier than we had done before the pandemic. But it's it's okay to take time off because we all need to look after our mental well-being. I think so. Yeah, I can 
relate to that personally. Um, you know, it's been a very, very busy time over this period and we've been rolling out Stribe to lots of wonderfully large organizations supporting the measurement of mental health and engagement and getting these metrics that you talked about at the start to inform change and strategies. And I suddenly went, I can't think. I can't, I can't think at the minute. So the team encouraged me to take last week off, but take last week off. And I did. I, I didn't do anything. I can't. Um, but I came back so refreshed and challenges that I wasn't able to kind of just process that normally go, come on, that's an easy thing to think about. I, I couldn't process it. And having had a week off just to think and go back to those boxes about what's important, it's just having that headspace um, that I think that leaders from the top have to encourage. And, and my biggest takeaway for myself is to make sure that my team are not just taking their holidays, but they're, they're potentially taking time off at the right time. Or if I notice signs, it's encouraging someone whether it's their own day off or whether you give them time in lieu or support them, it's back yeah. to those outputs. That's so important. It's, I mean, that's a great thing that you actually recognize that in your team. It's, it shows that you know your team so well that you can see if one person is lagging a little bit and they're not themselves, then you understand that you need to give them a bit of a nudge and say, it's okay to take that time off. So that's, yeah. That's they did that to me that was the amazing thing because i think we're promoting a wonderful topic around culture and well-being i forgot to promote that back at times and i think it's yeah. looking at ourselves as leaders and those that are in the audience today that's a key point if, if things aren't happening or they seem slow it might be because the person is shattered in your team or you yourself might be tired and taking time off yes it's difficult at the minute because of the environment but just turn the laptop off and close that down yeah. So how are you looking after your well-being? What, what, what do you do? Because obviously you've got 4,000 staff, 600 locations, yeah. and all of this great advice. What do you do? I, know. I think it's easier looking after them than it is after my two children, my husband and the cat. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think um, to be really, really open and honest, I, I've, I realised that my, I always thought I had great mental health um, until the pandemic and until the lockdown and being... Um, you know, stuck in the house with two very young children. My eldest is almost five. My youngest is two and a half and trying to work and trying to support all these. And it did get to me. Um, it, I, I finally realized um, that I need to start like yourself. I need to start taking my own advice. Um, exercise is my, and I don't want to sound, you know, I'm quite cliche to say exercise is great for your mental health but it genuinely genuinely is and now that the gyms have closed again um I'm not going to let that stop me I'm still going to go out for runs and walks and yeah I I love to eat so cooking and eating I'm I have a Persian background so we love to eat a lot of rice so I need to exercise to keep that off but you know I I truly, I genuinely do live by what I preach. Um, you know, as soon as I realized that my mental health was deteriorating, I got on the phone to my doctor and I said, look, I think I need a bit of help here. I'm not doing too good. And I think that's really important to give ourselves a break and to understand that, you know, just because we have such important roles within our, um, you know, organizations, we're still human. Um, and we still need to look after ourselves. So yeah, exercising, cooking, baking, and what watching rubbish TV. <laughs> so it's okay to comfy. You've heard it here for the first time from cancer researchers. <laughs> as much as you can and exercise at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> I've got one more question personally I'd like to ask in terms of the future, but I've got a question right at the top here that I don't want to miss because it's been there for a while. Yeah. Um, did the organization subscribe to a type of external mission such as time to change? You mentioned that you're bringing your own practice, but have you done anything yeah. free or during? So we did. So again, this is prior to me joining um, Cancer Research UK last year, a year and a half ago. Um, we did sign time to change, which was a very, very big thing because that showed that our directors, our board, everyone is invested in mental health. Um, unfortunately, we've heard the news that Time to Change have had their funding, which is a really, really, really sad um, thing to hear. But they've done such amazing work and we don't want to let that go to waste. So I was thinking we could create our own pledge, you know, in line with the Time to Change pledge as well to keep going, to keep doing what we're doing. As I said, we I'm training to be a mental health first aid trainer myself. So that's great. I'll be able to do a lot of the training, more training, training more um, mental health first aiders up. Um, yeah. 
Well, I think my team are going to absolutely love me for this, but if you'd be up for it, Samoya, and if anybody else listening today would be up for it, we'd be more than happy to discuss kind of, you know, how we could pick up something like a time to change that could be consistent. Oh, Obviously, amazing. it won't be as, 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 as well developed to start with as that, but we'd love to kind of support our partners to think about how we could kind of set some kind of key priorities and strategies to keep that up. And if anybody in the audience hasn't quite got their well-being strategy aligned yet, maybe we could look at a little working group together. So I'd be more than happy to kind of um, open the floor to that to, to you and I, and maybe we can see if the audience in time would be supportive of that. But we, Yeah, we'll that sounds, that. yeah, that absolutely sounds fantastic because Time to Change was such a great initiative and it's such a shame to see, um, see it come to an end. So yeah, absolutely agree. Let's see what we can do to, to pick this up ongoing. And that will transition very nicely into kind of one of our final questions today, which is what's the long-term changes that you're exploring ongoing? Obviously we heard about what you're continuing for your mental health champions and your wellbeing champions. Yeah. You've talked about always understanding your team's needs and getting that feedback in a regular way. Data and KPIs being really, really key to measure this all. Absolutely, yeah. What are you doing next? Do you know what, Mike, to be really honest with you, I'm always... Since this pandemic, I've been a bit concerned about making long-term plans because you never know what's going to happen. Um, I started planning something and then suddenly we're going into a second lockdown. Mm. So I literally had to scrap everything. But exactly what you just said, I, I want to be able to put a really good reporting platform so that I can turn around and tell my seniors, look, all this well-being um, you know, stuff we're doing. Here's, here's the outcome. Here's your return on investment that you've been asking for. Um, having our well-being champions set up to, re you know, I think that would definitely help with embedding well-being into um, into CRUK's culture. Absolutely, and I think going forward, I want well-being for Cancer Research UK to be, you know, an everyday occurrence, an everyday business. It's going to be part of every team talk that's happening. I want it to be part of every policy that goes out they will have a well-being aspect to it so I'm hoping within the next year we'll definitely be able to complete embedding well-being into everything and I think that needs to be a common theme for all of us because yeah. I think it's fair to say lockdown in its any tier is here for a while uh, we need to try and embrace it rather than fight it um, in terms of it's going to get back to normal this is the new normal and it's really really important that we do things like something that you're talking about in terms of getting that strategy in place, getting buy-in from leadership or understanding why we can't do that um, and then working through that and ultimately getting our people on the front line in any role, any capacity to, to buy in and, and support because as a leadership team, as an organisation, we can also only do so much. We need buy-in from the 4,000 staff, from the 10 staff on the front line to believe in what we're doing and to give us feedback all Absolutely. the way through. And I mean, I just I just want to say one more thing before we finish is that I don't want anyone to ever feel that well-being is a nice thing to have. I want everyone to know that well-being, especially mental well-being, is an absolute must in every organization. You know, if you've got a high turnover and you wonder why you have a high turnover, have a look at your well-being. Do you have a well-being strategy in place? What are you offering? Um you know, just offering people cycle to work schemes or, you know, I care vouchers isn't really enough. And you need, you need something else to show people that actually if you come and work for us, then we will look after you as well because we respect you and we completely get why wellbeing is so important. Well, on that note, that is all of my questions. I think that's a really powerful statement to leave with. Um, Joanna Boan has said, it's not a question, but we do offer a mental health first aid course online for free for most. Yeah. If anyone would like details, please let us know. So that is there for anybody that would like to follow up with Joanne Boan. Joanne, if you want to put your organisation into the chat straight away, then please do so and, and everyone can pick that up before we wrap up. But from my point of view, first and foremost, Samoya, thank you so much for your insights. I know it was a very broad topic and one that's very close and, and passionate to you. Um, I hope the audience has been able to get a kind of um, some sort of key insights some validations that are on the right paths. And if we think about kind of well-being, if it's not quite, quite getting through the directorate, then you've got to push a little bit harder because as Samoya says, it's about getting that buy-in from the top. And if you've not got it yet, then it's not going to work. Think about your structures. Think about how do you capture 
real-time feedback if people are in manufacturing or on the front line or in a dispersed workforce how can you get that information to those individuals via via managers or via solutions and systems and then think about the technology that can enable that because we're moving through a digital transformation piece that some organizations are moving a lot faster than others and it's okay to work at your own pace as long as we're working towards supporting employees and my final note for today is your people are your number one asset in any capacity. If you think about taking those people away, nothing will happen in any organization, whether there's one, 10, 10,000. So make sure we're looking after one another. Keep safe, keep well in the lockdown 2.0. Um, my email, if anybody wants to speak to us, is hello at strivehq.com. If you have any further questions that you'd like to ask us or, or put to Samoya, I'd be more than happy to kind of pass them back to her. I'm sure she'll be able to answer. But Samoya, yeah. Thank you so, so much. Do you have any final notes before I click end and thank everybody? No, thank you so much, Mike. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you as always. Thank you so much. Everybody have a great day. Go for your peas, go for your coffees and back to the old Zoom world and look forward to speaking to you all soon. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.